Plasmid DNA Insights, expanded focus on CMC in gene and cell therapy development. That's our topic for today. Welcome everyone. I'm Arslan Arif, the publisher and founder of Endpoints News. And I'm really excited to moderate this webcast, which is sponsored by Aldevron. Our guest today are Dr. Anthony Davis. He's the chief executive of Dark Horse Consulting. Next up, we have Ken Bonnell, SVP of Quality and Regulatory at Aldevron. Next up, we have Biswara Dasgupta, the Director of Quality Assurance at Sarepto. And lastly, we have Frank Bonelli, Director of Supply Chain at Encoding. So if you have any questions during today's webinar, please feel free to submit those using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We reserve some time at the end to answer questions that come through, and we look forward to seeing the questions that you have today. But I'm going to get started with a discussion for the panel. and. Our first theme is changes in the field. And Dr. Anthony Davy, I wanna to go to you first. What impact have the various FDA and EMA regulatory pathways had for cell and gene therapy developers? Oh, thank you, Arsene. And that's a great question to kick off with. I think it frames uh, so much of what we're going to talk about today. These pathways that the FDA and the EMA and honestly, all of the world's major uh, regulatory jurisdictions have put in place in recent years uh, have each been impactful uh, in their own particular way. Uh, you've got a perfect list there. Uh, there's RMAT I'll come back to, uh, but breakthrough, fast track, priority review, accelerated approval. You know, word of caution, they all have specific impacts. You know, uh, fast track is you know, unmet need uh, for a serious condition. Breakthrough is a substantial improvement over an available therapy. Um, accelerated approval really revolves around having a surrogate endpoint uh, for, a, for a major unmet need. And priority review means we'll take care of it in six months rather than the normal PDUFA timeline. Um, so each of those have their specific nuances and it's not a competition to collect as many badges as you can. You need to get the, uh, the type of acceleration um, that, you, that really works for you. RMAT, again, specifically for regenerative medicine, which is a very sort of uh, antediluvian phrase right now for what we now call cell and gene therapy. Uh, but the RMAT designation, uh, again, is primarily based on two or three mainly actually clinical criteria once you've really decided what your drug is. They all boil down to the same thing, opening up a wider, clearer, and more responsive channel of communication with your regulator. That's what it's all about. And that is the, the priceless uh, thing which everybody's looking for here. Um, in the pandemic era, and combined with that, the enormous acceleration of gene and cell therapy as a field and the number of submissions involved, you know, time and bandwidth at your regulator is the, is the priceless commodity. You know, In-person meetings have become conference calls. Conference calls have become email correspondence and keeping that channel open uh, for those little technical questions, which are your know, quick interaction, a quick dialogue will resolve a quick piece of education of the regulator, because yeah, we're still, uh, we are still educating the regulators. Uh, that's what everybody is looking for and obtaining these designations, one or, one or more of these five designations uh, is critical to have a competitive advantage um, and to get your drug through the pathway as soon as possible. So for gene therapy, especially because the regulators have been so consumed with the COVID vaccines, um, as well as the restrictions the pandemic's placed on the regulators and the sponsors, uh, I think these have been enormously accelerating. And Arsalan, you're the first one to be on mute. Of course. That's going to be me. So actually, thank you for that. And I want to actually ask Frank Benelli here. So capacity is certainly an aspect of speed, uh, but it takes a lot more to successfully achieve the right quantity and achieve these specifications on a rapid time frame. Um, so what are some of these necessary attributes when you're looking for a CDMO? Make sure I'm not muted. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Uh, and thank you for having me here. Um, yeah, you mentioned speed, and speed is so critical when when we're dealing with these therapies that that uh, with the patient need out there. Um, but yeah, and speed in in terms of capacity is also very critical. I know we'll get into that topic uh, a bit later. Um, 
but in terms of what I look for in a CDMO, um, there's really four four quadrants that I that I use. Obviously, the most important one being quality and regulatory, and the kind of track record that the CDMO has when when it comes to to those two major buckets. Um, what did the quality audit find? Um, you know, what's the, the the facility that we're going into? What's the inspection track record there? Um, so that's first and foremost, uh, quality and reg. Um, technical is a second bucket that 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 is uh, is of, of great importance. How's the process development group? How is the scalability from pilot scale to the large scale or the or the um, the reactor that we're trying to go to? Um, you know, the, a third element, obviously not the most important, but must be considered obviously is cost. How does uh, the pricing structure look in terms of you know, the pricing per batch and, and, and what type of grade plasmid we, we're trying to, to, to go into, whether it's HQ, GMP source, full GMP. Um, and then the fourth really is more of the intangibles of the alliance management side of a partnership. You know, what I always say is I'm, I'm looking for a partner to play paddle ball, not tennis. I'm trying to collaborate with you and, 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 and get this program, the, the most critical raw material, which is the plasma DNA. So that's uh, a very, very good question. Okay. Um, well, actually on plasmid DNA, um, back to you, Dr. Anthony Davies. So what is the current perspective of regulatory agencies with regard to these pre-commercialization activities relating to plasmid DNA? What have you seen the agencies require as far as the process characterization and validation? Yeah, it, that, that's the that's the commonest question. That's the biggest technical question we feel, we field in this area. I think uh, you know one of the things that one of the unfortunate coincidences in this field, which is kind of obvious, but I want to state up front, uh, is use of the word you know, GMP plasmid. Okay. Now the confusion arises because historically plasmids have been drugs, and they still are. There are naked DNA drugs, vaccines, uh, and, and so forth, and have been actually for many years, actually more, more than a decade. And if the plasmid is the drug product, then, picking my words carefully here, uh, then it, it must be manufactured under CGMPs. That is GMP plasmid. Now, if you wish to use GMP plasmid as a primary raw mat or a secondary raw mat for that matter in your gene or gene modified cell therapy product, fine, it's a little over the top, uh, right? It's, a, it's like you know, buying Lipitor as a, you know, as, a, as a component for one of your experiments. Um, you can, or you can buy a kilogram from Sigma, a kilogram generic from Sigma. Um, and uh, then, then I think what you have to do is start walking back through the use of plasmids as a primary raw mat, a first tier raw mat. So for a pure play gene therapy like an AAV product, yeah, they're one tier back behind uh, the drug product itself. For a gene modified, you know, lentivirus modified ex vivo cell therapy, uh, then they're, they're two tiers. You use the plasmid to make the lentivirus, you use the lentivirus to make the, the, the drug product. So you're two tiers back. And yes, there is a sort of you know, sliding scale of, of quality management, uh, which the FDA is looking for, because there are tertiary raw mats and quaternary raw mats, which you pay attention to, but th there is there is a pecking order here. So let's get that, you know, I, I don't like, you know, apologize to anyone on the, on the panel who does like this phrase, I don't like the phrase GMP plasmid. What we're talking about here is plasmid, which is a suitable raw material for use in manufacturing under CGMP. Okay, a bit more of a mouthful, I'll admit. Um, but that's just, I just wanted to clarify there. Now, the, uh, you know, the well-characterized uh, plasmids, which Aldevron and others bring to the market and their tiering system um, is, is, highly, uh, is, is, is highly clarifying to the industry um, and has provided a good stratification here. Answer your question, the regulators look for it to be fit for purpose. Okay, it's as simple as that. They don't mind what it's called. They don't mind whether it's called GMP or super duper documented or whatever it's called. Uh, they, they will, their CMC reviewers will go down the checklist uh, of the quality management system, the chain of custody, chain of identity, which uh, sits behind the products, the in process controls, the manufacturing consistency, just as they would do for a monoclonal antibody, which is being conjugated to your magnetic beads or some other similar raw mat. So, you know, determine, do, do the risk analysis, do the uh, FMEA, determine exactly what you need from this critical raw material, 
and take it from there and it will survive. It, your, your plasma, your, the source of your plasmid as a raw mat uh, will uh, be judged on its merits, not on what it's called. Uh, on 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 the label, so that's that's the high level answer to the question. Happy, you know, in the Q and A from the audience as well. Happy to go into more specifics, uh, but I really want to drive that point home. It's got to be fit for your purpose. Excellent. Yeah, I want to um, quickly just tell the audience that if any time you have a question come up for our panel or myself, just go ahead and hit that Q&A button and get your question in. Uh, I want to follow up on a thread that you're talking about, um, Anthony, and actually pose it to Biswarup. So you're doing um, quality assurance or Sarepta. So from your perspective, could you tell us about these regulatory expectations shifting in the context of CMC and the manufacturing of plasma DNA? Well, thank you, definitely. Uh, before touching that, I want to touch a couple of points that Frank and Anthony made. So uh, in so, what Anthony said right now is, is so much true that we do and we follow, right? That what the plasmid is going to be used for. Don't use the term if it is not necessary. And the face appropriateness is so important that if you are, say that using this plasmid in your development lab, uh, there's I don't know why you have to use a GMP plasmid in that sense. So, so understand that, understand the risk, Anthony touched on that, so understand that, and based on that, make the determination what is really right. And, and, and that would be the suggestion. And just again, before I answer the question you asked me, uh, touching on the CDMO selection, uh, obviously Frank touched on it, and, and when we do, obviously the first thing obviously comes uh, to quality mind is the quality audit. And, and we do different aspect of the CDMO and based on our use, based on the phase we are in, uh, whether we are in the early phase of the development or in the late phase and how the CDMO is going to support. Frank also touched on that it is going to be a partnership, right? So we have to lay out our expectation and, and uh, the CDMO that we are going to work with has to understand and also support it because as again, the next question, the question that you asked me, whenever we are making that CMC section, or doing the filings, uh, these all details has to be there. Uh, so how, how the process is controlled, so whether the CQS are identified. And uh, uh, top of that, again, uh, that at some point I'm guessing the way it is changing and uh, Anthony or Ken can correct me if I'm wrong. I think the regulators are going to go and start auditing this plasmid facilities at some point. Now I understand at this time, maybe they are not under the scope but uh, with the criticality, and in some cases when plasmid becomes the drug product itself, uh, it, it, it is becoming, it, is, it will get more and more scrutiny. So the GMP okay. aspect is very important. Yeah, we, if I can just jump in there, Biz, I mean, you're, you're right. Um, it's not going to happen tomorrow and probably not the next day because the, everything is so backed up and, and jammed up. We have trouble, you know, we, we have clients who are you know, basically you know, crying for their PAIs, and uh, the, the, there's a pecking order here. And again, it's 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 the it's the vaccines, and and it's the pandemic, which yeah. have piled on top of each other to really gum up the um, especially international uh, inspections. Uh, but you are right uh, that once that thing uncorks, uh, then there's going to be a slew of inspections, and uh, there's, some people are going to get some bad news. Okay, Ken or Frank, anything to add to this field on changes in the field before we move on to our next topic here? All right, let's move on to our next topic here, which is construct design elements. And Ken, I'm going to go to you first on this one. So is the industry moving in a direction where there's more attention paid to plasmids earlier in development, uh, or do we still have a ways to go? Oh, thanks for that. That's a great question. And thanks. Uh, thanks for uh, posing it to me. Uh, this, the short answer is yes. Right. And kind of to link to and link to what everybody was saying here. Um, if you look at um, the the FDA and other regulatory agencies, they're all around fit for purpose, right? So that's that's obviously one thing, and I and I have some uh, data to, to kind of you know, back up my assertions here. So it makes sense that they're going to pay attention to it earlier in the process. Um, and, and I one of the things I point to is you look at the PDNA over the years, depending on its use, again fit for purpose. You know the way that that PDNA has been classified. It's been really you, you see the shift me being moved from starting material or critical starting material to drug substance, right? 
So that actually, just that alone should tell us, yeah, there's more, there's more attention being paid uh, to, to PDNA earlier in the process. The second thing that I'd point to is, you know, is that we're looking at the origin of replication because that reduced size can result in more copies per gram. So you're talking about a, a bigger yield, right? That's obviously important from a, uh, a, a supply perspective and, and being able to actually deliver these therapies to patients that require them. Uh, the third thing that I would I would say as well is that um, you know back, back to it really links to the, the yield that I was just referring to was that um, the low yield actually drives more residual host impurities. So obviously that's important as well, uh, especially since there's been several guidance documents published recently about uh, you know cross contamination impurities, things of that nature. Even one that was just published recently on neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, talks about uh, kill purification and the impact of plasmids and, and, and testing to make sure that uh, there's no exogenous or, or contamination in that. And, and I, I guess the last thing I would point to is, is if you take a look at all the guidance documents the FDA has published throughout the years. In 1996, there was a document uh, published around plasmids that was entitled Points to Consider. It wasn't that prescriptive, but it did actually did articulate the FDA's thinking from an overarching or high-level perspective on plasma DNA and what it took to produce you know, a, a good quality batch. Uh, then in 2007, the FDA released another uh, document which superseded the 1996 document uh, on uh, considerations for plasma DNA for infectious uh, disease indications. Right in that, the FDA said these are things that should be addressed before phase one clinical trials. One is they they talked about okay, look at the manufacturing process. You know, look at the details around the plasmid construction. Uh, look at uh, you know sequencing. Look at you know bulk. You know what types of uh, you know visual inspections should occur. You know what type of plasmid con concentration. What should the, what should the supercoiled plasmid content be? Uh, and and also there there are other things as well around the release criteria. Around like okay you should actually be testing for you know pyrogenic substances, endotoxins, things like that. So you know they brought that whole concept that we that if you're on quality it kind of really resonates with you. So, you know patient safety and product quality. Uh, so. Uh, all that actually, as you see, just throughout, the, you know, that was only an 11 year span. And then this, in, in 2020, last year, the FDA actually um, published another uh, guidance document on uh, you know, human gene therapy, uh, FDA perspective on uh, the CMC uh, for you know, human uh, gene therapy uh, and IND uh, types of filings. And, and they really got into, okay, well, uh, some, again, more pre prescriptive around you know, sequencing, more things around, you know, CQAs. Uh, more around like in-process testing and controls. You know, one of the questions I get asked all the time, and I, I refer to this document you know, repeatedly, is that you know, when we're in the early phase development, can we actually test for information purposes only? The document's very clear. The FDA's you know thinking is articulated in there. They say that you can have the range be broad, but you can't really test for information purposes only. You you know you can actually narrow that over time. Uh, and then they talked about, you know, in this document about, you know, again, impurities, which, you know, there's several documents that have been released since then, as well as risks, basically an open a process versus a closed process. So I know that was kind of a long answer to your short question, but I use all that information in, in its totality or in aggregation to say, yeah, there is focus on, you know, this earlier in the process. Good. Well, I got more questions for you on this, Ken, so don't worry. And we also have a good question here from the audience. I'm going to read it right now uh, because um, it's from Michael in the audience uh, regarding supercoiled content. Um, it would be great if Ken could touch more on this. What is an acceptable level? What are the QC methods being used? Yeah, so the um, the, the preferable, again, I'm, I'm using FDA guidance, is, is above 80%. Right, so that I would say that's probably the standard that that I would use, um, and you know I don't really have a, a great answer for the, the the methods being used to determine this because I think there's some lots of uh, limit there's lots of limitations around the current technology. I mean there's there's next gen sequencing and things like that that are that are coming out um, that are and are currently being used. Uh, yeah, but I, I would say you would actually just rely on the current processes that are in place today. Excellent. Okay. Well, let me follow up with you. And, and if anyone else on the panel wants to chime in, please do. But but Ken, I'm, I'm going to direct this back at you. Uh, you sort of answered it in your last question, but I just want to give you some space to just elucidate the most important elements of construct design that you've considered. 
um, is for use in viral uh, vector production. Yeah, so you know, I, I thought long and uh, hard about this, um, you know, throughout my career, and I, and I think there's a, there's a there's a couple of things that actually come into play here. I think one is size. I know that sounds very basic, but if you talk about a microplasmid, which is about two thousand base pairs, versus a bacmid, which is one hundred twenty thousand base pairs, there's some process implications there. So you're talking about the efficiency of the uptake when you get to AAV production. Um, you know, I, I think the, the other thing as well is that you know, the location, the restriction site for gene insertion, right? What's the location on the vector? I, I think that's important. Um, I, I think the, uh, the end analysis in terms of the, the emission of uh, exogenous sequences is important. And I, and I think the other thing as well is, is that looking at the, the different systems, you know, antibiotic versus uh, non-antibiotic -anti systems, such as ampicillin versus kenamycin versus sucrose, uh, this can impact the, uh, the regulatory pathways, the yield, uh, the long-term success. Um, so uh, to me, those are the most critical elements. Okay. Um, how about anyone else on the panel? Why are some of these important? And um, anyone have any experience on not considering these early in development? What's the impact on that? I mean, I think I, I would just add a general comment. You know, uh, I, I saw a question out there about, you know, the actual methodology for determining that age percent of supercoiling uh, from Michael, who asked it. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's kind of up to you. You know, the, again, the FDA is going to accept whatever method you offer. You know, personally, I go with DDPCR, uh, just mm -hmm. that's my preference for determining supercoiling. Uh, there's good literature, been a good literature on that method for the last five years. Uh, but there's a lot more to it, Michael, than just selecting the method. You've got to demonstrate the methods fit for purpose. And if it's a, if it's a release test on a critical quality attribute, that method had better be validated. Um, so I think you know, that, that, that's what I comment there. But the more, that's a more general comment, that if you're looking at attributes, um, then again, a bit like the plasmid as a raw mat, the, the test method has got to be fit for purpose. It's got to be validated if it's used in a commercial context. Um, and I think the, the FDA and the, uh, the MHRA, if I can single those two regulators out in particular, is always looking for additional deeper methods. Um, NGS is, it, it's a thing nowadays. And I think the day uh, where a, a complete sequence as a release test, I know that makes people sort of throw up their hands in horror at the prospect, um, but it's coming. Okay, and uh, I think it's it, ultimately it's going to be a good thing. Um, so I would you know, enjoin uh, the listeners to you know, read the literature, stay current. Um, you know, Aldevron and others have been at the forefront of adding these tests. They look at them very carefully. Um, but it's an arms race uh, in the sense that uh, it's, it's an arms race to guarantee better safety and effectiveness to, and drugs, you know, better and better and better. So it's a good arms race. Wonderful. Anything to add before we move on to our next topic here? And um, I wanna thank the audience. We have hundreds online um, and I see questions coming in. Uh, I have several, I'm gonna try to answer them around some of the content that we have planned. So please keep them coming over here. Um, let's move on to another theme, evaluation of in-process and standardized release testing. Uh, Biswara, I, I wanna go to you first over here. So what assays have been most representative of the quality of a plasmid product? What ensures that we're releasing product that is high quality and protecting patient safety? Okay, so these all kind of tie, tied into some of the things that Ken and Anthony was saying, right? So first thing, in my, I always say this to people that what phase you are in, the testing has to be phase dependent. You just cannot just start, start to see everything from the beginning. The, the regulators don't expect you to do that, even in the gene therapy products too. So in the early phase, obviously we all know that uh, the safety is primary goal. So you have to make sure that there are certain tests that are safety specific. Uh, the guidance documents that uh, Ken mentioned about the plasmid DNA, they have certain tests listed. So obviously we all consider those to start with or to develop our spec. Um, Anthony also touched on uh, the spec setting. So I, I want to be, um, make people aware or be careful about this term uh, specification. Uh, some people I've seen use this term for the in-process samples, be careful. 
generally, uh, action limits or alert limits are more appropriate in those uh, in process settings. Uh, once you fill the specification, it is it is a bigger uh, deal than failing action limit in, in, in that sense. So that I'm saying for the in process, make sure that you are choosing it wisely. Uh, for the testing, again, as I said, face appropriate, uh, choose the safety testing. There are certain quality testing that are appearance. Uh, those are common testing, uh, super coiled, uh, another one. Um, so that is another thing. The other thing I will also touch on where you are going to use this plasmid at what stage. I have seen in some places people do both steady test and bioburden test as release spec. I don't understand it. Why? You know? Uh, so be careful. If you fail the sterility, again, you are in deeper trouble. If the plasmid is going to go uh, for further manufacturing in this case, and if you are not claiming a sterility or you're not calling it a sterile plasmid, why doing a sterility test? So your spec justification report that you are developing at, along with your MSET or quality team needs to look at those parameters and then develop justification accordingly. Um, obviously it is going to be part of your uh, CMC uh, submission. So once you do that, you're kind of locked. So before doing that also, uh, it is important to look at those uh, parameters, particular parameters. But again, going back to your questions uh, in process testing, uh, people do, again, it is, you, you have to do the uh, process assessment, work with the Ramsey team to develop uh, those test, particular testing at different stages. Uh, and then for the release testing, obviously, I will, I will say that go to the guidance, pick those five or six that are listed, and top of that, whatever else you feel uh, are, are important, again, for your product, for that, part, for that particular phase. Again, I will keep on emphasizing on this, okay, phase appropriate specification face appropriate uh, action you should take, okay? All right, um, wonderful. Um, Ken, I got a couple questions uh, for you here. Uh, I wrote one out in my notes. I'm gonna ask the question as I wrote in my notes here, um, but I see BG in the audience has a very similar question. So I'm gonna read my question first, and then I'm gonna ask the audience question and get your response. Um, so what process optimizations can be made during plasmid manufacturing around QC specifications or, or QA in general? So are there any major gaps or unnecessary risk aversion steps being taken today? That was my question. There's a one, just an add-on I wanna get and then get your full take back on it, is that as compared to large molecules, how much importance is placed on the process by the regulators as compared to release testing and COA? Yeah, I, I think there's a significant uh, emphasis placed on the, the process. Uh, I, I, one of the things that I would say, and uh, and something that we've moved to here at Aldebaran as well, is the, the use of single-use technology. I mean, I, I talked about the the different uh, you know guidance documents and some of the, uh, the 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 papers that the FDA has published around you know cross contamination and exogenous sequences and you know. Uh, containment and things of that nature. So the use of single-use technology, uh, I, I think is critical. So that's that I would point to that as the number one thing. Uh, the second thing is, is that, uh, you know, the in-process testing, in-process checks uh, need to be implemented if they're not in place already in order to confirm the quality of the material during the manufacturing process. You actually see that even in the, uh, some of the early uh, guidance documents that the FDA has uh, mentioned. Uh, and segregation practices, you know, kind of the link to what I said about, you know, containment, cross-contamination. So separation and containment, uh, especially in multi-use facilities is important. Um, I, and I, I also think that, uh, you know, there's some, there's some uh, technology limitations, right? So, you know, certainly with the uh, sequencing technology today, you can confirm the gene of interest through sequencing, uh, but you can't really eliminate the the potential for exogenous sequences or contamination. So in other words, you can confirm the sequences there, but you know, that doesn't tell you the, the, the entire story. Um, you know, I, the other things that I would point to is, you know, good quality practices, you know, trending your OOSs. I think they provide your knowledge of your systems and your processes uh, and give you an early indication if there's any trends in either the positive or negative direction and allow you to proactively address them. I mean, that's just good quality. Uh, I think having a robust quality system in general is important. So things like, you know, change control, you know, you know no, no changes are made, obviously, without, you know, betting through a, a thoughtful process that's approved, you know, 
CAPAs, making sure they're being installed correctly and you don't cap effectiveness checks. Uh, and, and the last thing, you know, one of your, I think one of the components of your question was around optimization is, you know, don't things like, you know, real-time batch record review and having quality presence on the floor. Uh, I, I think all those things uh, together actually are extremely important. Okay. Um, let me ask a quick follow-up question. What are your feelings on using a rapid qPCR test for mycoplasma testing for lot release testing, like Thermo Fisher's MycoSec assay? Yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm actually on the fence. And the reason I say that, I think the technology is great. Um, I just don't know if it's been fully accepted by every regulatory agency across the globe. So I, I think that's the challenge. I mean, certainly, as technology advances, I think the regulatory agencies have to advance with it, which I think they do. Um, yeah, but I, 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 they wait a little bit, at least in my experience, to see you know if there's any you know negative repercussions, if there's anything that actually comes out from using these processes that actually doesn't come out from the you know the early phases uh, during development. So um, in other words, it's a little bit of a waiting game. So that that would be my only negative. But I, certainly, I'm aligned with you know rapid technology. I mean, we've installed a, uh, a rapid sterility process here um, uh, that we use as well. So I, I just jumping in there, Ken, I, I totally agree with you. I, I love RMM, right? Yeah. I, this this is so great that we are moving and we should take full opportunity of this technologies and uh, steady test RMM, those things are there for a long time. Dr. Miller is really a pioneer in this field. And so in my mind, if there is a method, again, it is not a USP method, USP has the traditional microbiological yeah. method, but if you can demonstrate through your validation, Absolutely. right? side by side, perform this and submit it to the regulatory. Uh, FDA is more open if I'm not wrong. On the other side, EMEA probably a little, uh, I don't want to use the time conservative, but maybe still has to catch up kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. And uh, uh, something I neglected to mention, I, I totally agree is that, you know, if you can, if you can do a comparability assessment where you don't a uh, traditional USP 71 sterility test, and actually show equivalency, you know, through a rapid sterility test as well. You're right. I, I think that goes leaps and bounds to getting it accepted, not just within the industry, but with the different regulatory authorities across the globe. Yeah, that also saves times in the supply chain, right? Because that's in 28. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Let, let me just take one step back and let me ask a question from the audience from Janet. Would you recommend NGS over Sanger sequency as part of plasma DNA QC release? Who wants to take that? I mean, uh, <laughs> I, 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 we, we touched on NGS earlier, uh, and I think that's probably what, what prompted Janet's comment. I mean, N NGS, uh, the great thing about NGS is it generates a ton of data. And the really bad thing about NGS is that it generates a ton of data. Okay, so, you know, if you look hard enough, you'll find it. And I think uh, there is poor guidance about, so, you know, if you've got a single base mutation, right, somewhere in the plasma, and you will, do you want 999 out of 1,000 genomes to be okay? Do you want, is 998 okay? Um, you know, what about maybe you look at 10,000 sequences or, or 20,000 sequences? Uh, because you can. It's a bit like talking, you know, we also talk in the cell therapy field, believe it or not, about sequencing um, the genome of cell therapy products. You'll find something bad. If you look hard enough, you'll find something bad. Now, that said, um, in NGS, I, I'm totally convinced NGS will, will happen as a release test, probably a lot by lot release test, probably as a lot by lot release test of pure play gene therapies, okay? It'll happen. We just got to wrap our heads around uh, the, you know, if you look you'll find something bad, a uh, part of it. And, and the FDA needs to, needs to issue a guidance here. So if you're, if you're listening, then I'm sure you're thinking about it. Um, we, we, need, we need a guidance document on this, on this subject. All right. Um, anyone else? I, I, I wanna ask one more question here from the audience on, uh, on super coil content. Is anyone using atomic force microscopy to evaluate super coil content? That's from John. Not, not in a GMP context in, uh, in our experience. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, right. I, I, I think there are, I mean, I think it's, it's a great method. Uh, and you can, you know, you, you, it's a visual method. You, you can see the supercoil plasma, it's, it's great. Uh, but I think it's, um, you know, that, that in itself makes it hard to imagine how that could be qualified or, or validated uh, in a QC context. It's you know, a big, expensive piece of machinery. Um, I would say right now, uh, stick to something with a bit more, a uh, bit more of a quantitative readout like DDPCR. Uh, we have not advice that. All right. Okay. Well, I want to uh, counsel the audience, keep the questions coming uh, for our experts over here. Uh, Frank Bonelli, let's get you involved a little bit over here. A question for you on, on how we can reduce the time from start to finish, uh, of course, without risking patient safety and efficacy. So what steps are opportunities to reduce inefficiencies through optimization or innovation from your perspective, Frank? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And, and I, I, I look, I, I come at this from a supply chain and operations perspective, right? And we always hear that we can't put, you know, science on a timeline and, 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 and those conversations which are, which are absolutely true. But what we can control is, is, is when we have secured the capacity that we require to, to manufacture what we need uh, to inform certain decisions. And that requires uh, sometimes certain risks, financial risks that you have to take. And that's when, you know, when I talk about partnering with a uh, CDMO in terms of scheduling and flexibility around, you know, what happens if, if there's a delay coming out of R&D. Um, but that's one thing I've, I've seen that the timelines really get compressed from the time that that science is ready to when the time we have the capacity book to say whether it's manufacture a master cell bank all the way to bulk um, and, and release testing to be able to put it into a vector. Um, or, or certain elements uh, of that process. But having that, uh, you know, taking that risk in terms of, of, of securing the capacity is, is one way that I've seen that, that you can really comp compress the, you know, after the science comes, uh, compress those timelines up. It, it, very, it, may, it make your process very quick from that point on. Um, in terms of innovation and, 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 and you know, reducing, um, you know, opportunities to reduce inefficiencies, um, and optimization, um, you know, same thing. You, you want to keep your, your opportunities open in terms of, you know, when, when you have several constructs that are that are leading the race, and and in terms of improving either yields or or scaling up uh, from a from a smaller reactor to a larger reactor, your change control process um, is going to be critical in staying lockstep with your regulatory group. Um, if you've already had a filing, you know, it's all very stage appropriate at that point. Excellent. Okay. Um, Ken, well, if, let me ask. If, if I may jump in there, just for one thing uh, that Frank said, again, there are two aspects to this. Supply chain always is, is looking to compress, right? They want to make sure that the drug goes to the market faster, whereas quality is always looking for quality angle to make sure uh, the product is safe. So there is always opportunities in my mind that people need to understand the process very well and perform, I always say, perform the risk assessment. Get a risk champion or someone who understand can help you to perform the risk assessment so that you can take some of this, uh, maybe some of the things that are delaying the process and take it out. One of the example I can give, say the mycoplasma testing, right? Let's take that as an example. You have a cell bank and then you're performing mycoplasma testing there, for example, okay? And then do you need to perform it in the downstream of the process if you're performing it in the cell bank? You have to perform a risk assessment on that. If your entire process is closed and there is no interaction, you are not adding anything else, uh, then, then maybe there is no chance. Or performing in the downstream, downstream of the process, don't do it in the upstream of the process, like in the cell bank. So some of the things I think it is very important that people need to understand uh, or perform the risk assessment to reduce. There are opportunities in rapid microbiological method that can cut down the time. So explore those. There are automations that you can consider that can also take away or, or, or save some time. So risk assessment is very, very important to perform in my mind to, to before you can compress or reduce any of your uh, parameters of testing or anything like that. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, so, um, Anthony, where do we see the industry going in the context of standardizing QC panels and process standardization in general? 
Um, yeah, that's, uh, isn't that the question? I think, um, you know, I'm going to get back on my fit for purpose hobby horse here. I think, you know, there is, let's just think about monoclonals for a sec. I mean, yeah, you can pretty much write out a, you can pretty much write out a spec sheet or a C of A for a monoclonal these days, uh, but there's always something, you know, if only the potency assay. Um, so I think there was always going to be something uh, unique and which requires you to think it through and make sure that your, um, you know, your, your characterization is fit for purpose. Um, it, it, it's very nuanced. It's one thing for a plasmid to be used. I mean, let's take a current example, which is, which you've covered at endpoints a lot. Uh, the, the emergent biosolutions, uh, you know, debacle in, in terms of cross-contamination and so forth. It's one thing uh, for a plasmid to be released or a plasmid derived product to be released for use in a multi-product facility. Now I understand that emergent is adenovirus, it's not a plasmid-based manufacturing process, it's good old-fashioned virology, uh, but it, it, there, you know, in a, in a glass vial, one adenovirus stereotype looks much like another, okay? And in a glass vial, one or any vial, one plasmid looks much like another. And the opportunity conf for confusion is, is, is right there and super critical. You know, there are, there are manufacturing plants we're aware of that are asking questions such as, you know, can we manufacture the same AAVs except for the transgene, you know, in the same suite, at the same time, consecutively after after a line clearance, uh, you know, one base is everything in a plasmid, and that makes it a little special as a raw material. Um, so I think you know that level of you know sort of belt and braces uh, QC belt and braces chain of custody labeling. Your know, barcoding is great, QR coding is great, um, pushing the pushing the quality management system out. You know, beyond the actual GMP suite where the where the can of plasmid is opened, um, it is going to be critical. Uh, but again, I think you know I'll, I'll dodge the question, Arslan, and say yeah, you know, fit for purpose, whatever you need, the agency is going to view it uh, every every process and every spec sheet and every CRA on its merits. All right, well, I accept that. Any other thoughts from the panel on this? before we get to some more questions from our audience and thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us and please there's there's still a little bit of time to get your questions in um Biswar, if i just want to go to you quick uh, for your comment on this there are variations on the release specifications for assays such as endotoxin and supercoiled percentage for example a lot of the audience are focused on that over here so what are the thoughts from the panel on the impact of stringency of these specifications for these assays. Biswarp, I'm gonna to go to you, but anyone else on the panel have thoughts on this? In my mind, again, I, I think we touched on it a couple of times now that I, I will keep on going back to the phase appropriateness. When you set your release specification or whatsoever, it, look, look at where you are and what is needed. In the early phase, it is well accepted that you, you may not have a uh, value Right, you can do report result, not in the safety aspect though. If it is a safety test, you, you must have uh, something concrete. Um, but in other cases, probably you have the opportunity. Whether again, that 80% supercolor or whatsoever, I mean, kind of as we said, we took it from the guidance. Uh, if you have something different that you can convince the regulators, uh, absolutely, why not put the uh, scientific justification together and, and submit it. Um, but but when, again, when it comes down to release, it is what phase you are in and where it is going to be used. That is very important. Any other thoughts from the panel on this one? Let, I'm going to go to a question uh, from Michael again, a quick one um, on plasmids. So for plasmids, perhaps mainly the ones above 15 KB, what are the concerns regarding concatomers, if any? Anyone on the panel here have an answer for this one? Well, that, you know, that's a pretty technically focused question, which I'll, I'll take a stab at. I'm sure, you know, I'll everyone thinks about this pretty deeply. Um, it, 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 it's a concern when 
it impacts the the function of the plasmid. You know, plasmids can tack concatamerizing is going to get it into a tangle, and it's not you know the right polymerases are not going to attach to it. You know, that's a problem. I think uh, you know for large plasmids, as as the as the question is indicating, that can be it can happen more, and it's more of a problem. Um, but I think uh, you know the 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 basic idea again is just to characterize it well, establish the level of concatamerization, and if you can correlate that with loss of function, then that's a problem. If you, if you can't, then it's not. I don't think I don't think intrinsically it's a problem. All right. Well, let's move on to a question from Anesthesia. Um, here's the question. I'm going to read it regarding plasma DNA as template used for mRNA IVT. Is it important to look at supercoil percentage for quality assessment? Is that type of plasmid required as raw material or API by regulatory bodies? Like the COVID vaccine made by Pfizer and Moderna. Yeah, I'll jump in there again. I think I put on the on our private chat channel. I said, boy, people are really obsessed with supercoiling this morning. Um, <laughs> Uh, look, I mean, again, uh, you know, supercoiling is a bit different from con concatenarization because um, that is likely really to get in the way of things accessing the, the DNA sequence in a plasmid. Um, okay. Um, and uh, you know, it requires you know, nicking and complex uh, enzymatic uh, activities to resolve. Um, it, 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 that's, that's something that's not going to be easily dealt with. So I think, uh, you know, I think there's a good literature that you know, excessive supercoiling is problematic in terms of transcription uh, for IVT and manufacturing uh, mRNA vaccines and so on and so forth. Again, the problem is, is you know, what are you going to do if your plasmid really likes to supercoil, uh, but enough of it's not supercoiled for you to get the transcription uh, that you need uh, to make your mRNA, then you, know, you can live with it um, as long as the manufacturing process is quote unquote under control. Um, but if it, it's going to make your life a little bit more expensive um, if, you, if you do choose not to resolve it. I will say that in IVT situations and COVID you know, mRNA vaccine situations, um, you're not dealing with the same sort of stoichiometric requirement for plasmid as you are if you're making an AAV or making a lentivirus by, uh, by co-transfection, okay? There, are, you, you need to get a functional copy of each plasmid into every cell. Uh, with, um, you know, with IVT and mRNA production, um, the, the plasmid is, is reusable, basically. Um, so you're, you're dealing with, I'm sure you're seeing this at Al Devron, that although you, you, you know, people think, oh my gosh, you know, their plasmid is the raw mat for mRNA vaccines, you must be bursting at the seams of that. Probably, I'm guessing probably not the case. Uh, because the absolute quantity of uh, plasmid you use to make an mRNA um, is, is, is more catalytic than stoichiometric. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, Frank, I have a question for you um, from where you sit at ENCODED. So how do you at various stages of your organization prioritize and balance business needs, vision with the science and regulatory requirements, that balance right there? How do you guys do that at ENCODED, Frank? Yeah, there's a there's a big balance between what what R and D is doing with uh, with current programs or future programs and and what we take to certain levels of of manufacturing, right? Whether we take it to a like like we've been talking about phase appropriate GMP research grade uh, whatever it is, um, and it's really it really boils down to internal communication with with stakeholders of. You know, there, there's a couple of things that we must do in order to hit certain 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 time points. Um, if we want to keep the optionality open for, for let's say three different constructs, um, and we have, you know, real targets to, to get to certain, certain points in the life cycle of a, of a program, then we, we, we might have to do certain things at risk. Um, and, and that, that carries a financial, um, a financial burden. Um, so as long as all those things are communicated internally and, and the key stakeholders can make those those decisions, then all those options, all those options that 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 R and D is looking at, can remain open, and um, and our timelines can still stay intact. So, okay, all right, wonderful. Thank you um, for that. Uh, I'm going to ask some specific questions from here in the audience. We just have a couple minutes left um, over here. So, um, here's a question from John: Cell harvest is a bottleneck for large batches. Centrifugation to separate cells from media becomes very labor intensive. So what are the suggestions to augment this step? Well, 
This one's well, toughy, that, huh? That, that's the question for the production engineers. Um, so if, I'm assuming it's for plasmid production. Yeah, that E. coli paste is pretty, uh, pretty, pretty nasty. You <laughs> get large quantities of it around. Um, you know, continuous flow centrifugation is the industry standard uh, method for upscaling. Uh, the ultimate you know, solution is to increase the copy number of the plasmids per cell, and uh, you're doing that early on in the banking process, up or down, left on is what you do, I'm sure, is you, you will select you know, you know, your preferred master and working cell banks based on, the, uh, on how much plasmid they spit out per cell. There are only so many options here, uh, guys. Um, who is it? Um, I've, I've lost the I've lost the question already. Um, you've taken it off, haven't you? Um, well, it's under answered then. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I can't click through. I can't see answer. There we go. Um, so yeah, John. Um, I, there are only so many ways of doing this. Okay, you, you either increase the yield, in which case you're harvesting less cells, or, or you. Um, you, you, you go to technology, which is uh, continuous flow and uh, these highly viscous pastes, uh, resolving it from the chromosomal DNA is problematic as well. Um, there's only so many ways to go here. Okay. Um, let me ask a question from Chris Stove, um, and maybe this is directed at you, Ken. Um, are there plans to shorten the delivery time of plasmids? Or what can customers expect when more and more companies need plasmids? Yeah, so um, absolutely. So the answer to the first question, yeah, there is a, uh, um, a project, I guess, underway right now to shorten the delivery times. And, and that's around instilling, you know, Lean Six Sigma methodologies it's about, you know, optimizing processes, removing waste from the system, you know, doing things like, you know, real-time batch record review on the floor. So, you know, we, we are looking at our, and when I'm saying we're employing Lean Six Sigma methodologies, we're looking at all our processes, we're mapping our processes. Uh, we're looking at you know every single step. Is it necessary? Is it critical to quality? Uh, is it uh, is it an, um, necessary for, you know for uh, you know patient safety, product quality? Uh, we're asking all those questions again because the objective is not only to actually shorten the timelines, but ensuring that we have the you know world class quality as well. So um, th so we're taking all those steps right now to actually uh, shorten those timelines. We have goals and objectives. Uh, and in the last nine months, I, I don't know if uh, this is public knowledge or not, but uh, we've actually reduced our timelines, uh, our average timelines by about 40 or 50 percent uh, just by going through that exercise. Wonderful. Yeah, um, and then just to add to that, that's essentially what I've, the world I've been living in for the past five years is you know, limited capacity and everybody needs this critical raw material. Um, so that's why I've, 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 I've touched on it a couple of times with the importance of being aggressive with, you know, maybe not the science and, and speeding that up, but securing the capacity that your, your, your company needs for your program. That's, that's the really the only, one of the only key things you can do to guarantee that you have that when you need it. Um, and that's how while the science progresses, you can, once you do have that in hand, you can move through with your program. So good luck right. to whoever's trying to secure plasmids. <laughs> all right, um, well, that's why we're all here. Um, I, I have a quick, uh, quick fire question here. I think we've got time for two more questions. Let me ask a quick one from the audience. Um, this is one from Scott. Would the direct integration of a sequence from a donor plasmid into the genome of a cell therapy product for example, via HDR using CRISPR or similar tech, would this influence the quality expectations for this material? Stumper again. Can Anthony, anyone? We're going to have to just kind of leave this one open. Maybe if you can little expand yeah. on that, what do you mean by influence the quality expectation? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, Scott, if you want to uh, add a little bit more, I'll try to I'll try to ask that one again over here. Um, but really, uh, Ken, I actually I want to leave you with the last word. Anyone else that wants to chime in on this? Uh, but Ken, I think this really gets to the heart of the matter why we're here. Um, based on your experience, either direct or through your depth of exposure in this field, where do you see the most opportunity as it relates to efficient quality plasmid manufacturing? 
I, I think it start, starts with leveraging technology. Um, you know, things like I, I talked about earlier, improved sequencing capabilities, rap, rapid micro testing, uh, establishing those equivalencies between, you know, compendial methods, um, you know, rapid sterilities I just mentioned. Uh, th I, I think that in considering that's an inherent limitations with older cells, there's limitations around growth. Uh, and what I mean by that is like, you know, when you, when you think about scaling, uh, you don't have bacterial cells that can replicate indefinitely. Uh, this is one of the reasons uh, why there's uh, research around synthesizing DNA chemically uh, from a large scale perspective. Uh, and I think that the, the last thing, uh, the last consideration is really uh, considering um, condensing those transgene sequences. I mean, if you make it, if you make it smaller, uh, you can produce more of them. I mean, that's that's just basics. So, uh, in my mind, that's the those are the, the the three or four things that I would point to. All right. Okay. Well, that's all the time that we have today. I want to thank our panel for sharing your knowledge with our audience. Thank you to our sponsor, Aldevron, and all of our expert panelists, Dr. Anthony Davies, Ken Bonnell, Viswarup Desgupta, and Frank Bomelli. If you'd like to rewatch this webinar or share it with colleagues, a link for on-demand viewing will be sent tomorrow. I'm Arslan Ara for Endpoints News. Thank you for joining us, and we will see you at a future webinar. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.